Isaac Newton. Like all influential scientists, Newton's great achievement was to overcome the prejudices of his day, just as people today fear ideas like genetic science. Whereas I think, can there be anything in this world less worrying than the cloning of sheep? <laughs> the whole point of sheep is to be identical. <laughs> Has anyone ever walked past a field and gone, hang on? <laughs> That one in the top left-hand corner is uncannily similar to the one third from the right. <laughs> in Newton's time, the fear of science came from the church, which said that everything is as it is in the Bible. But the amazing thing about Newton is that although he was probably the most influential scientist ever, he was also obsessed with witchcraft. So he was the perfect example of how, when human beings take up a new set of ideas, they still carry with them a lot of the ideas they had before. For example, I'm sure when someone converts to Islam, for a while they must think, well, a bit of bacon can't hurt. <laughs> it should, however, be pointed out that the following statement is not true. Oh, yeah, yeah, Isaac Newton, he's the bloke who invented gravity. <laughs> Which would be right if before Newton, if you wanted an apple, you had to go up in a hot air balloon with a net and try to catch one as it floated about like you were in a 17th century version of It's a Knockout. <laughs> Newton was born in 1642 during the English Civil War in a Lincolnshire village called Wallsthorp near Grantham. Now, at one level, he was quite an ordinary boy, so one day he chased a lad who'd kicked him in the stomach, and according to a relative... Isaac beat him till he declared he would fight no more, then rubbed his nose against the wall, pulled him along by the ears, and thrust his face against the side of the church. <laughs> <laughs> now, of all the things you'd like to see in history, what could be better than Isaac Newton in a fight? <laughs> the only thing better than that would be if it was against Galileo, who turned up with his telescope going, Where's your tool? <laughs> While he was at school, Newton lodged with the Clark family, who owned a chemist, which Newton became fascinated in. And Newton used the chemicals to conduct his own experiments and invented his own potions. For example, a cure for wounds on the body, which he recorded in his notebooks as... A small portion of mint and wormwood, and 300 millipedes well beaten, <laughs> with their heads pulled off in a mortar and suspended in four gallons of ale in its fermentation. <laughs> to be drunk two or three times a day. <laughs> He also threatened to burn down his mother and stepfather's house. So at this point, however much he might be on the way to scientific genius, you wouldn't want to let him near a Bunsen burner. <laughs> he sounds like he's going to become the sort of kid who'd go, I discovered gravity and then it told me to set fire to the library. <laughs> So Mr. Clark, who Newton was lodging with, arranged for him to visit Trinity College, Cambridge, where he won a place as a student. And this is where it becomes apparent that Newton wasn't just a genius, he was around at the perfect time for his genius to flourish. Because for hundreds of years, education had revolved around the Catholic Church's interpretation of Aristotle. Now this bit feels slightly odd for me, because there's already been one of these lectures on Aristotle, and it's frightening how natural it seems to go, so what was Aristotle's theory of how the planets moved? Come on, we did this in the last series. <laughs> Aristotle thought the planets and stars moved around the Earth in search of a natural resting place. Objects were made of four elements. Earth, water, air and fire. Earth and water were on a mission to find their natural resting place in the Earth. Fire and air were trying to get into space. Everyone and everything in society, planets, apples, kings and peasants, had a natural fixed position. But the first major breakthrough against these ideas came from a Polish civil servant, Copernicus, who explained how the Earth went round the Sun rather than the other way round. Having worked this out, though, it took him 20 years to get in round to publishing it. And it finally came out on the day he died. Which I suppose is the civil service for you. <laughs> then Galileo, with his telescope, discovered that Jupiter had several moons, which upset the Pope, because they were supposed to be just seven heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon, and five planets, and seven was the heavenly number. So the church forced Galileo to renounce his findings or be executed. A sort of, you didn't see no moons tonight. All right. <laughs> So he renounced them. The Catholic Church did apologise to Galileo and give him an official pardon. In 1998. <laughs> so by that reckoning, by the year 2350, they'll get round to apologising for fiddling with half the world's choir boys as well. <laughs> 
Kepler worked out that the orbits of the planets weren't exactly circular. And again, Kepler resisted his own theories because of their social meaning. Why would God have made orbits that weren't perfect circles? It made God fallible, as if God was going, right, try again with Mars. <laughs> no, nope, circles are the one things I can't do. So these weren't just scientific discoveries, they were huge jumps in philosophy. This was enormously disoriented, because for a moment nobody was sure who or what they were. Now, the nearest thing I can get to this, I was once on a train in Denmark, and it went into a tunnel and stopped, and there was an announcement, <laughs> and then people started getting off, and I thought, well, maybe there's a fire. So I got off the train, and then there was a door in the wall of the tunnel that people were going through. And I thought, I'm in the middle of a weird dream. <laughs> in a minute, Jimmy Savile's going to arrive. <laughs> Would you like to buy a tadpole? <laughs> so I went through the door and followed people up the stairs, and then I realised the train had gone onto a boat. <laughs> and I was on the sea. <laughs> they do it on purpose, the Danes, to drive people mad. It's a social experiment. Danish nut houses must be full of people going, I thought I was on a train and I was on a boat. <laughs> but imagine that on a more gigantic scale even than that. Nobody knew where they were. They thought they were sitting still. It turned out they were hurtling through space. They thought everything was going round them, but they were going round the other thing. The Catholic Church, therefore, saw these ideas as a threat, and they opposed them vehemently. But a layer of society were enthusiastic for the new thinking, and in turn, they hated the Catholic Church, to the extent that Newton believed that the Pope was the Antichrist. <laughs> so Newton went to Cambridge at a pivotal point in the history of ideas, and he went in a period that must have seemed fairly cataclysmic. The plague had wiped out 100,000 people in Britain, and this was followed by the Great Fire of London, which must have resulted in millions of people going, Oh, we haven't had much of a summer, have we? <laughs> Newton probably wasn't helped by these distractions, so he only just scraped through his degree. But then he was free to develop his own theories, and he began by inventing a whole new field of mathematics called the calculus, which he used to work out the exact speed of objects. The only trouble is this requires loads of calculations and mathematicians love making them as hard as they possibly can. For example, one book about Newton by David Berlinski boasts in the introduction Nothing in this book requires very difficult mathematics. And within 20 pages it says Brackets A plus B close brackets N equals A N plus N A N 1 B plus N brackets N minus 1 close brackets over 2 A N minus 2 B squared plus dot 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 plus N B N minus 1 plus B N. <laughs> Even better, one of the twos has an exclamation mark after it. <laughs> An exclamation mark after a sodding number? What's that supposed to mean? Is that a mathematical symbol or is it like on a holiday postcard? Brackets over two. Ooh. <laughs> Maybe mathematicians have a magazine with a letters page. Reading Mr. Berlinski's two exclamation mark put me in mind of the occasion my wife and I were in the Cotswolds and we came across a seven <laughs> exclamation mark. <laughs> Once Newton had his device for measuring exact speeds and acceleration, he became even more obsessive than before, spending his whole time in his office working out equations, like a little boy locked away with his video games. Trying to find the answer to problems posed by previous generations. For example, once it was established that the planets were all moving, it set the question of what it was that was moving them. The first attempt to answer this came from the philosopher Descartes, who was as well as saying, I think, therefore I am, refused to ever get out of bed before 11 and he often spent the day meditating inside a stove. <laughs> the French know how to do philosophy, don't they? <laughs> Descartes suggested that everything, even space, was made up of an ether that, when moved, pushes the next thing along. And some people interpreted this as meaning that angels were pushing the planets at a tangent to make them go in a curve. What a brilliant image. An eternity of angels going, try it now, let the clutch out. <laughs> Newton's quest to work out his alternative answer began when, according to his friend William Stukeley, the notion of gravitation came into his mind, occasioned by the fall of an apple as he sat in contemplative mood. Why should it not go sideways or upwards, he thought, but constantly to the Earth's centre? Which is a little bit different from the popular story that it landed on his head and he yelled, Bloody gravity! Hang on, what did I just say? <laughs> 
In fact, he may even have been having a game with Stukeley when he told him this story, because everyone at that time thought of apples as a symbol of knowledge due to the apple's role in the Garden of Eden. So the whole idea of falling apples had a different connotation. And then Newton studied Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler and Descartes, and he began to work out a theory that every object exerted a force that pulled other objects towards it. But he didn't publish his findings for 20 years, uneasy about laying them out formally until he could prove them mathematically. And in the meantime, he moved on to work with light. Now, at the time, it was assumed that colour was made up of a combination of light and darkness. But Newton bought two prisms, and he shone the light that came through one onto a wall where he could see the white light divided into its seven colours, as happens with a rainbow. And then he shone the colours back through another prism, where they all blended back into white again. Now, this might not seem like much. He was mucking about with light. No one would believe this possible. Then he invented the first reflecting telescope, using two mirrors at angles that resulted in a far clearer image than anything that had been used before. After this, he was offered a job as Professor of Mathematics at Cambridge, where he could study his projects as long as he presented a series of lectures each year. The first one was in 1670, where he discussed his theories of light, but hardly anybody turned up because he was such a bad speaker. And in fact, he was so bad that for the second one, no one turned up at all. <laughs> and then for the next 15 he did, absolutely no one. It sounds like he had the same problem as most science lecturers, full of brilliant ideas but unable to get them across without being incredibly dull. They could make anything boring, most of them. <clears throat> if you uh, look in this cage here, you see a live, uh, live panther. And uh, with my new machine, <clears throat> there we are, uh, it's uh, disappeared. <laughs> Newton wasn't bothered by the lower tenants. For the next few years, he got up at six, he worked all day until late at night on his theories. But that's not to say that his only interest was his science. Using the book of Ezekiel, Newton tried to work out the day of the second coming. He thought it would be 1948, but he also worked out that as the number who believed in Jesus was diminishing, Jesus would have to come back before the year 3150, as by then there'd only be one person left who believed in him at all. <laughs> And Newton was a keen follower of the Rosicrucians, who believed that they could converse with angels to make themselves invisible. The great thing about being a member of them was you'd never have to go to the meetings. <laughs> Newton was also motivated by a deeply held belief that in ancient times, a man called Hermes Trismegistus was visited by gods who revealed to him the secrets of alchemy. Newton had made a friend, Robert Boyle, and together they worked on the theory that they could achieve their aims by mixing an impure iron, another metal, usually either lead or mercury, and some citric acid from a fruit. These had to be ground together for up to six months and then heated and left to simmer for ten days, but the whole thing had to be done by moonlight or by light reflected by mirrors. <laughs> now, at this point, Newton seems to be like one of these people you meet from time to time at a party. And for the first hour, they seem fascinating. <laughs> and I'll be thinking, oh, this bloke's a laugh. He likes the Asian Dub Foundation. He can't stand New Labour or Alan Titchmarsh. I might keep in touch. <laughs> and then they say, I can't make Wednesday, because that's when I take my settee to furniture therapy. <laughs> Newton's favourite book was The Chemical Wedding, which gave advice such as Build a temple of one stone, with no beginning or end in its construction. A serpent sleeps at the entrance. Seize him, and making a step of him, climb up and enter. You will meet a priest who has changed the colour of nature and become a man of silver. <laughs> To most people at the time, concocting theories about invisible forces pulling the planets was just as nutty as trying to change one metal into another with magic potions. They were an attempt to interfere with God's nature. Back then, magic and astrology was the prototype of science. It was one of the first times that people had considered the possibility of changing nature to suit human society. Attempting to predict the future through charting the stars was a way of asserting that humans didn't have to accept everything was God's will and beyond our understanding. Which probably doesn't apply to these people who go, I went into Dartford today to get some window lean, and then I looked at my stars and it said I was likely to go on a journey. <laughs> To Newton, there was a scientific basis to trying to find the potion that could turn lead into gold, just as there was a mystical side that God had inserted to keep apples on the ground. So it was only the most extreme example of someone caught at the time between being an early scientist and a late sorcerer. 
Even the Royal Society, revered as the highest scientific body in the land, had pursued an experiment to make insects out of cheese. <laughs> Even if you could do it, why would you want to? <laughs> Did someone think... The trouble with this world is there's not enough insects. <laughs> if we can crack this cheese idea, we can have blue bottles all the year round. <laughs> In 1687, he published a book called Principia. In the Principia, he set out to prove his theories about gravity, and part of this concerned his laws of motion, the first of which was... Every body continues in its state of rest, or of uniform motion in a straight line, unless it is compelled to change that state. So he was saying here, there is nothing natural about staying still. If something is moving, it's not natural for it to stop. Leave it alone and it will carry on, which seems mad, because everything around us is doing all it can to stop, and it takes a huge effort to get it moving. Roll a ball, it will stop. Get on a train, it will stop. <laughs> but, said Newton, for anything to have stopped, something must have made it stop. If you roll something, it stops because of friction, and things fall to Earth and then stay on Earth because some force must be pulling them to Earth. Whereas if you took these forces away, as happens in space, the ball or the apple or the train would just keep going. But if this was true of small objects, he said it must be true of big objects, like planets. The Earth, for example, keeps moving without needing to be pushed by anything. It would go off in a straight line, but the force from the sun pulls it back, and the result is it goes round in an orbit. So Newton was saying the opposite to Descartes, that planets move because they're attracted by bigger bodies. It's like when I was 18, part of me felt pulled to move away from home, and part of me felt an opposite force dragging me back where I could get all things done for me. And the two cancelled each other out and left me spending an entire year, half a mile from home, in a poxy pub playing darts. <laughs> His next law of motion was that nothing can change speed or direction unless some force is applied to it. Now, at first, that can seem a little bit obvious, because all he's saying there is if you bang something, it goes off in the direction you banged it. But this law only seems simple once you accept gravity as being one of the forces that can make things change direction. Now, Galileo had carried out experiments to show that if you throw a ball, it goes in an arc all the way to the ground. Nothing was banging into the falling object, so the thing making the object change direction must have been an invisible force. I'll tell you another thing. When I was doing the research for this and I was reading all them calculations, I thought back to when I was 14 and the maths teacher was there with a blackboard with all these numbers on the board, and he's going, still pay attention. And every time I go, when am I ever going to need to know that? <laughs> He caught me in the end, Mr. May. <laughs> now, the difficulty with Newton's theory for most people is the big problem with physics, that it's full of forces you can't see. It's like when I first heard about sound waves, and I just went, Muh. what are these waves then? There's no waves when there's sound. And somehow, when you do this, you act as if you've come up with a stroke of genius, as if that night on the news they'll say, A boy in Swanley School transformed the world of physics today by debunking the myth of sound waves. <laughs> It turns out they don't exist after all, because, as he put it in his formulation, you can't bloody see them, so how do you know they're there? <laughs> now, to set about proving gravity, Newton said the amount of gravity from any object is determined by three things. The first is the mass of the object doing the pulling. So, because the Earth has a mass, which is six times greater than that of the Moon, its gravitational pull is six times more than that of the moon. And we accept this because we've seen film of the astronauts. The astonishing thing is that Newton knew this would happen in 1687. Imagine if no one had discovered gravity and then someone suggested to you, oh, on the moon, with the same effort you put in Earth, you can jump six times higher. <laughs> on the moon, old people could jump onto their roof and go, now, what did I come up here for? <laughs> One of the first people to accept Newton's theories was his friend Halley, who then applied it to a comet he'd seen and realised that he could predict when it would come back. But when Halley asked Newton for his calculations to confirm this, Newton couldn't find them. <laughs> what was he doing with these things? You can't wander around the house going, oh, has anyone seen that bit of paper where I wrote down how the universe works? <laughs> LAUGHTER But now Newton and his allies were able to predict the paths of heavenly bodies. Over the next few years, the Principia only sold a few hundred copies, which can't have been helped by Newton's decision to write the whole thing in Latin. 
It was part of a deliberate strategy on his part to ensure the book only reached academics, whereas now science books have gone the other way and you get things like... Out now! Universe in an egg cup! The staggering discovery that the universe may be only half an inch long! He made me wet my pants! Says Ricky Martin. <laughs> But the Principia had a rapid effect. Engineering and philosophy began to merge into a single subject that would eventually be called science. Newton was now offered a job as a Member of Parliament, which he accepted. But while he was an MP, he only made one speech, which apparently was... Could someone close the window? I've got a draft on my back. <laughs> Shortly after this fiery maiden speech, Newton became depressed to the point where he almost had a breakdown. Newton's mood became even more volatile during the only time he appeared to be in love with a young Swiss mathematician called Nicolas Fatio de Duillier. Fatio fell ill and sent Newton a desperate letter. Yesterday I had a sudden sense, as might be caused by the breaking of an ulcer. As yet, I have no doctor that perhaps could save my life. I thank God my soul is quiet, in which you have had the chief hand. At which point you feel that this is the perfect story for our tune, except that Fatio then spoilt it by living for another 61 years. <laughs> More worrying for Newton, Fatio started leaving papers around that would give away Newton's secret life as an alchemist, which shows how fleeting the prejudices of any society are, that in the 1680s a bloke could think, if I'm not careful, that bloody boyfriend, he'll get me out here as an alchemist. <laughs> Being gay doesn't seem to have been an issue hardly at all. And then when you think 300 years later, when I was 18, something must have gone horribly wrong, because I'd sit in a pub where we were so bigoted we didn't even think anyone could be gay, really. You could do any one of dozens of things that would make you sort of gay. Reading a poem, buying a flower, staying in on a Saturday night, not being able to park your car first time in a tight space. <laughs> That's at a bit of an angle, you queer. If someone had said, do you want to come round mine tomorrow and turn some tin into gold, we'd have gone, yeah, all right. Here, it's not to make jewellery, is it? <laughs> Even now, you can't help it change your perception of Newton slightly once you know he was gay. You imagine him saying, because of gravity, I can't help but go down on a body with a large mass. <laughs> Newton and Duduillier were together for about four years, but the pressures of the relationship seemed to get to Newton. Eventually, Duduillier returned to Switzerland for good, after which Newton had a real breakdown, and he wrote a letter to Samuel Pepys. I'm extremely troubled at the embroilment I am in. It is sensible that I see neither you nor the rest of my friends any more. And at the height of his detachment from reality, he wrote a splendidly bonkers treatise called Praxis. Artifius tells us that his fire dissolves and gives life to stones. You may multiply each stone four times and no more, for they will then become oils shining in the dark and fit for magical uses. You may amalgamate the stone with the mercury of three or more eagles. Thus, you may multiply to infinity. Eventually, he took up an entirely new career as master of the royal mint. He did this because the level of counterfeiting was so great it was threatening to wreck the economy, although it carried the death penalty. He became fanatically diligent in his new job. He started dressing in disguise and following suspected counterfeiters into pubs to listen to them for evidence. And through this method he brought the conviction of hundreds of counterfeiters, his record being in February 1699 when ten were hung in a week. And remember, he was from near Grantham. <laughs> Shouldn't someone start checking the water? <laughs> a typical victim was Anne Pillsbury, who tried to pass off a sixpenny piece, and her small daughter was then subject to a body search. The findings were... Wrapped in a paper in the said girl, five pence worth of farthings and four sixpennies, two of which were counterfeit ones. It's hard to think of anyone who has ever been so brilliant in one of their jobs and then so appalling in their next. It'd be like if Nelson Mandela got a job in an aquarium and then got done for shoving fireworks up a dolphin's arse. <laughs> Newton kept this job for 20 years, but his position within the world of scientific respectability was confirmed when in 1703 he was elected President of the Royal Society, which was deemed a huge honour, although they were still keen on some unorthodox theories. For example, the journal book of the Royal Society reported a new medical cure that... Cow's piss, drank to about a pint, will either purge or vomit with great ease. I think the notes of the Royal Society got mixed up with the minutes of the rugby club. 
Newton eventually died in 1727, aged 85, after refusing the last rites. So where does that leave Newton? Now, according to one list of the most influential people in history, Newton ranks at number two with Mohammed top and Jesus third. Though there's probably a top 100 influential people show on Channel 4 that he's not in at all, with the top two being Jade from Big Brother and the bloke who jumps through a wall in the jeans advert. <laughs> From the French Revolution onwards, romantics like William Blake despised Newton for reducing the universe to a mechanical set of equations with no room for imagination. But they were doing him a disservice because in 1936, Newton's papers were bought by the economist John Maynard Keynes, and it was he that discovered the bundles of stuff about alchemy and magic. And of all the things Newton thought he might be accused of when he was working out how to use a stone and a sacrificed snake to get to a silver priest who could change colour, I bet he never thought anyone would say. The trouble with him is, he's got no imagination. <laughs> After reading Newton's collection, Keynes wrote, Newton was not the first of the age of reason, he was the last of the magicians. And however weird he may appear to us, and however dreadful his attitudes towards counterfeiters, he was driven by a passion to uncover the secrets of the universe. Whereas now the education system regards science as a series of facts that should be learnt and regurgitated. So Tony Blair has praised a creationist school because it achieved high pass rates. On that basis you could have a successful devil worshipping school. The kids can work out the angle of pentangles in seconds. <laughs> And the main aim of science seems to be to blow things up now, which is mine as well at school, but at least I stuck to test tubes. George Bush uses Newton's genius to stick missiles into space with the statement, Outer space and cyberspace are the main arteries of the world's evolving systems. The United States uh, needs to guard against breakout capabilities in space and cyberspace. <laughs> If Isaac Newton did come back to life, instead of using his brain for anything useful, the Americans would lock him in the Pentagon and tell him to come up with a perfect system for getting rid of America's enemies. And the brilliant thing about him is after two years he'd emerge and go, I've done it! Now I just need four million millipedes and I can make myself invisible. <laughs> then I can walk up behind Saddam and turn him into a bottle of fairy liquid. <laughs> <laughs>